Thinking aloud. Conversations on the leading edge of knowledge and discovery with psychologist Jeffrey Mishlove. Hello and welcome. I'm Jeffrey Mishlove. Our topic today is P.K. Dick, Aliens in the Afterlife. And my guest is my good friend and one of the favorite guests on New Thinking Aloud, James Tunney, the Irish barrister who is author of many books, including The Mystical Accord, Sutras to Suit Our Times, Lines for Spiritual Evolution, the Mystery of the Trapped Light, Mystical Thoughts in the Dark Age of Scientism, Empire of Scientism, the Dispiriting Conspiracy and Inevitable Tyranny of Scientocracy, Tech Bondage, Slavery of the Human Spirit, as well as two dystopian novels, Blue Lies September and Ireland, I don't recognize who she is, and most recently, Human Entrance to Transhumanism, Machine, Merger, and the End of Humanity. James lives in Gothenburg, Sweden with his family, and now I'll switch over to the internet video. Welcome, James. It's great to see you again. And great to see you, Jeff. You're looking more like a transhumanist every day with your which are earphones. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's true. Well, we're going to be talking about P.K. Dick, Aliens and the Afterlife today. I know it's a, a popular topic, but when it comes to the writings of P.K. Dick, it does seem to be practically right on point. It, it's very interesting, and it, it ties into some of the discussions that you've been provoking over the years in relation to how these phenomena interact. Uh, because in some sense, he does make a connection at various stages between uh, aliens uh, and the afterlife itself. And in many senses, we're talking about the Celtic other world or that other world or that other worlds. So uh, in, in, he anticipates some of the explorations in uh, in science and it was very much a a creature of its time in the bay area there was a lot of people who are interested as you well know in aliens uh, in ufos in exploration of consciousness so th there was a, a a lot of exploration of these ideas and how they they linked together uh, he's a bit unique in in so far as because of his theological interest because of his, his conversations with bishop pike because of his own religious beliefs, that he didn't ditch the, the, the religious beliefs as well. So uh, also because of the nature of his mind, as if you read Ian McGilchrist, The Master of Things and The Master of His Emissary, it kind of it paints the picture of the significance of the right side of the brain and bicameral consciousness. And Philip K. Dick was very aware of that. So his approach was quite different from some of the literalistic uh, approaches of others and also um, he was he was prepared to take a, a different more holistic approach to to the, these issues so so they're not separate in, in in his mind in many senses it's interesting you mention his friendship with Bishop Pike who wrote a book called the other side about his mediumistic contacts with his uh, son who uh, lost his life by suicide and uh, PK Dick apparently took a very serious interest in mediumship spiritualism in the afterlife well it's very interesting Jeff even when we say the other side again it's like the other world and of course the word alien refers to other what is strange what is foreign or what could, in a legal sense what someone that comes from another country but it's about the other so the other side is is merely a dimension in which some of these phenomena happen so in 1963 1963 was a a traumatic year and it may in the future when people look back be a hinge point in history in the, in the history of, of civilization 
and there was a lot of uh, there was a lot of uncertainty and discontent and and, and fear and and uh, that was in the zeitgeist can can we say we can see this even in other dimensions you met father malachi martin and he traces the kind of takeover of the catholic church to 1963 as well and he, uh, philip k dick was also friends of ray nelson who uh, another science fiction writer and, and they went to high school together in berkeley and he also wrote eight o'clock in the morning which became the film they live which was a significant uh, idea about aliens and that but in relation to bishop pike because Philip K. Dick had had an experience, he had a vision, I think is the best word for this, of a metallic face in the sky in 1963. And he was very afraid. And he, he wondered whether it was God, or in Gnostic terms, it was a bad version of God, or the bad God as opposed to the good God. And that was what brought him to St. Columbus. And he, he became involved in the Episcopalian Church. And through that, he met, uh, he met his, uh, a woman that would become his, his wife, and that that woman's, I think it was his, her stepmother, was a mistress of Bishop Pike. So he comes into the circle of Bishop Pike and they have great discussions about uh, religion. And that, that would have informed the viewpoints of, of Philip K. Dick, why he would have taken theology very seriously and not, not dismissed it. And about uh, Jesus and the origin of the nature of God and the Holy Spirit. And of course, Bishop Pike experienced a lot of tragedy as we know his son Jim Jr. died uh, he committed suicide and uh, as part of the exploration and uh, the obvious grief that the father suffered he sought to uh, communicate her uh, as you know and as you've talked about that before now Philip K. Dick and his wife attended a couple of these seances as a kind of note taker so it was very interesting that he observed these uh, seances in California or a couple of them at least and he he took them to be real ontologically real that there was the son was communicating with, with uh, Bishop Pike uh, and uh, he, he seemed quite quite clear about that um, in some of his writings he, he, he expresses however a contrary a bit of discomfort perhaps with uh, spiritualism not with with the endeavor not with mediums but he's a bit concerned and you mentioned this on one of your talks about William James's view on it he's a bit concerned like William James that it may be some other entity that utilizes the the clothes the vestments uh, uh, if you like the personality uh, the mask of the person to communicate or to activate something which is no longer in existence but he, at the same time, he was able to hold contrary positions about things. So he contradicts himself in some senses. That's a, a kind of right brain approach to it. Uh, but he believed that Bishop uh, Pike's son was communicating. Now, a very interesting aspect of that, and, 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 a, and a, a, an unfortunate bit perhaps is, at one point, in one of the, as far as I remember, in one of the seances, they asked him where he was, and he said something like he felt he was in hell that's that's the, one of the reports that i read this is the, the son on the other side or uh, again one can interpret that in whatever way one wants uh, of course if one is on a, one of the intermediary planes it could feel like that but i think that experience uh, was taken by uh, philip k dick and utilized in novels like uh, ubik and uh, this was one of his very successful books. And how he uses that idea for me is by equating it with the idea of people in cryonic suspension. So where, as you're reading the book, it's, it's difficult to make out what's happening in some places. And it seems afterwards that actually we're listening to people who are in cold storage. We're listening to the thought process of someone who's in cryonic suspension at certain times. So I think he may have taken the para paranormal context and extrapolated that to a technological context and began to look at that idea of the state and the different states the mind may or, or soul may find themselves in. And also, when he, he, his approach to the Tibetan Book of the Dead, for example, also contemplated 
that the Bardo plane could exist on this plane, that we could be in the Bardo plane to some extent here. And I think there's a, there's a lot of wisdom, wisdom in that. But, uh, and also, after that, after Bishop Pike's uh, death in, uh, in 1969 in, in the desert on, on, his, on his trip to, to back to Qumran and, and uh, because of his particular interest in the Dead Sea Scrolls and, and in, in, in certain early sects of the, of the, uh, the early period of Christianity. Uh, Philip K. Dick also believed that it was possible that Pike, Bishop Pike was coming back to him. He was channeling Bishop Pike, which is another interesting uh, element. He also pointed to the fact uh, that there are, there are two examples of him speaking languages he didn't know. His, his friend, the writer Ray Nelson, said that he spoke grammatic, gr good grammatic Latin, which he hadn't learned. And he also later on spoke old Greek. Uh, and he believed that that was associated with uh, Bishop Pike in, in, in some way. Uh, so there's a very direct uh, link with Bishop Pike. And the last uh, later novel that he wrote, The Transmigration of Timothy Archer, at the end, was a, a, a literary, a barely concealed literary study of that time in San Francisco involving some of the characters looking at what happened and the kind of tragedy around Bishop Bishop Pike and uh, it, it's difficult to come to a final conclusion about what he taught. I, I, I get the sense that uh, he, he, he may have thought that Bishop Pike drifted too far from the clarity in relation to the the central endeavor in his effort to be open and explore everything. It was a very chaotic exploratory time, as you well know. But it's a very interesting relation that, that gives us knowledge about Philip K. Dick and about Bishop Pike uh, himself. Well, I think it's fair to say that Philip K. Dick was a genius and also a, a genius who had was right on the edge of sanity at times. So, so he was exploring many, many ideas and, and was willing to explore them to a depth that very few people were willing to go. I know one of the ideas that he played with was, was the notion that we're living in a simulation, that there are, one might say, alien consciousnesses involved in controlling everything that we see and hear and experience as the phenomenal world. And it, it, it's quite clear that Philip K. Dick is more a Greek than, than a geek that he's, he's more interested in ancient philosophy than he is in the technology, and most people acknowledge that. But a lot of people in contemporary times believe that he is a harbinger of the new transhumanist era. And in many senses, he's not. He's the opposite. In fact, I would argue that he may be a Trojan horse in that camp. Because, and why he's a Trojan horse is because he brings in a lot of the ancient beliefs he, he persists with the Kabbalah, uh, with the Bible. He brings them into contemporary context and, and, and consciously plants them uh, in the future. And, and he, he starts off one of his, his stories or one of his lectures uh, saying, well, how is in the future, if we're going to have this tyranny, how is the artist going to be able to protest? Because he understood that it, it would be uh, impossible for, for him to protest uh, in the future. So, in relation to the idea of the simulation, there's two different emphasis. In his famous lecture in France, he, he, he states categorically that we are living in a computer simulation. But in his writing, he states that we're living in something like a computer simulation. And I think that's, that's, quite, that's quite interesting because we have two things that look the same. Even in his logic, we have that simulacrum. And I think there's a, a bit of a problem here because the implication is that, well, everything we see around us is, is an illusion created by computers or created by a higher technology. And that suits a lot of people's belief about the, about the nature of reality because it, it gives a clear materialist explanation of, of the world. My view is that what he was saying is that the human can only perceive an approximation of the external world. And it's like a computer program uh, in that sense. And in, 
in that uh, interpretation, he's more like the scientist who studied perception, like Hoffman, for example, and, and how they say we interpret reality. And why he's saying that is because he's essentially accepting that we're spiritual beings and that the spirit moves in different dimensions. And that is our true nature. And therefore, the necessary physical world that's here on this earth, fine-tuned for us to adapt to in this context, clouds our inherent reality and uh, true nature. So I believe he's more articulating that idea that it's approximation. And if you come to the argument, well, it's a simulation, then you still have to come, you still have to ask, well, who's the simulator? Who is, who is creating this? If you want to talk in those terms, you still get back to the idea of an intelligent designer. And you still, you find yourself more uh, in the domain of certain traditional Christians, for example, which a lot of the scientific people don't want to be similar bedfellows to, but that's the consequence uh, of some of this, um, some of this analysis. So I, I think he's talking about an approximation. I think, in spiritual terms, the material world is not as important as the spiritual forces within it, and he does accept that there are different forces of information, his idea of a vast active living intelligence system and valis uh, or zebra, for example, is another interesting idea. The idea that uh, a godlike figure or divine figure can camouflage itself in material forms. I think he may have got that from Lurianic Kabbalah and the idea of the breaking of the vessels. It, it, it even sounds phonetically like the, the Hebrew word there, but he was informed by some of these older concept. He was trying to take them and put them in a new context. But insofar as he never abandoned the idea of a creator, a benign creator, a divine force, and he never abandoned the spirit, all he's talking about is a modus to interpret in a new way, a, in a rational way, which he wanted to do, that relationship between them utilizing the language of science, of physics, and of some of the explorations that were happening on the edge uh, in Berkeley. And uh, he was willing, in relation to his, his insanity, uh, uh, again, uh, we've discussed that, and I don't think he, he was insane, but he was willing to break down boundaries. Once you begin to break down boundaries, like in the right-hand approach, well, everything comes into the equation. Uh, and also his mystical experiences meant that he had that disturbance associated with the perception of an intervention from uh, an intelligent force in the universe. Well, you, earlier you suggested he's more Greek than geek, and it reminds me, obviously, of the, the, the parable of Plato's cave as an example of a simulated reality and, and the idea that whatever is outside of the cave causing this simulation, whether it's a deity, a, a deva, or a, an alien entity, it, there seems to be a very ind indistinguishable line between the, these possibilities. Yes, and I, I think there's two ways we can, there's a primary and a secondary way we can read the Plato cave in relation to some force projecting shadows on a wall, that the, 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 the typical one about some uh, creation of illusion cut off from reality is, the, is a primary one. But a secondary one could be an internal idea where we limit our ability to interact with the world. We retreat into a cave of our own making and the Shadow, the shadows on the wall are shadows of our ego, our, our psyche, in a limited view that we impose on ourselves. So, in, in a narrow, in that secondary view of Plato's cave, the liberation is about a self liberation. It's about that coming out of the cave and say, there's a, there's a broader dimension, looking at the realities that you talk about, looking at other consciousness, other possibilities, looking at what I call the animosphere, or looking at the total imaginal world. That could also be the other meaning of coming out of the cave of your own creation. And there may be iterations of that. In ourself, we limit our worldview, and we, we, we fail to see, we were blinkered. Uh, other people do the same thing. They try to manage us and show us things 
they, they, they portray in a propagandistic way what's happening, we're meant to interpret it. And then beyond that, there's another dimension, because when he's talking about tyranny on the earth and about a black iron prison of perception, he's, he's in the domain of Ephesians, that we wrestle not with flesh and blood, that uh, and we're, there's other principalities of wood. So in some senses, all these imprisonments, they happen within ourselves, they happen within society, and there's a, they reflect out or reflect in from uh, a, a sense of a duality in the universe, one which seeks to constrain and prison in a material way, and one which seeks creativity and growth. So he has that duality through, through all his work, going back to, to Persia the, and the Christian uh, ideas as well, uh, or the Buddhist ideas. Uh, in the perennial philosophy, that, that classic type of, of, of duality. So, so, so he recognizes that. So, so the cave may, uh, could be approached in a number of different levels. And he was certainly very au fait with um, a, a lot of the, those ancient thinkers because of his, his study on his own uh, in Berkeley as well. Also, the, the, the very notion of the alien is, is interesting. So often we think aliens must be biological entities such as ourselves. But I, I gather that P.K. Dick is exploring the idea of the alien in a much larger way. I think you use the term animistic, as, as if you know, the whole universe might be conscious. Yes, he, he does go through various iterations of beliefs in a kind of panpsychism, panentheism, and he, uh, but he really takes a wide view of the notion of what an alien is. Now, of course, in these contexts, in relation of the equation or equiparation of alien and extraterrestrial, that's a kind of recent phenomenon. That, that, that uh, idea of the alien as that other, the extraterrestrial, it's, it's quite late on. And he obviously came from a context of influence by comic books and science fictions where there were the aliens were everywhere, the, the aliens from outer space. That was standard for, 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 for children in, in that context. So we have to consider that the, the, the alien may be an extraterrestrial, but a terrestrial, and, and in that context, at a time when people were t thinking about going to the moon, and he writes Martian time slip about people living on Mars, the human themselves has become an extraterrestrial in, in the sense of moving away from, from the Earth. So it's becoming a lot complicated. And it, he, he goes back really to the idea of the, the, that which is foreign, that which is other. And the other could be in yourself. So when he writes a, a scanner darkly, he has a, a policeman who's investigating himself. He is so confused uh, in the context. And there is this idea that you can become alien to yourself. Yourself can become other. And that process of dissociation uh, creates uh, an alien. And then we have our, he, he has extraterrestrials, there's plenty of them. Uh, they're not all what you might think they are. Some of them are uh, want to take over the air. It's the usual story. But some of them are very, very benign. And in our friends from uh, Frolics 8, they want to save the Earth from the New World Order who have taken over. So we know that he believes that the, the future is one of gulags in the United States and of, of a, a New World Order and, uh, and a dystopian uh, control system. So in these, in, in some of these stories, the aliens are coming to 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 save the uh, the people on the earth. Uh, and he, in this, when he's discussing the android and man, he says that you don't have to have a technical android. That we all have an android within us, and we can become more android. So it's like Will, Colin Wilson's uh, idea. So that again reflects the idea that uh, within us we could become alien uh, to ourselves. And of course, the word for a psychiatrist early on was alienist. Uh, that was uh, from, from the French relating to uh, insanity. So, uh, and one little interesting story he wrote, I think it was, it was in 1975, was called The Eye of the Sibyl. And in this story, it's quite interesting uh, that he goes back to, or there's a figure uh, in... Uh, Rome at the time of the death of Julius Caesar and he's working as a priest uh, with the Sibyl of, of, of uh, Kume and he goes to to visit her 
and he finds that she is being advised by two extra, what we would call extraterrestrials. And from there, this character in some way has some connection through time, and the Sybil can look through time to the future, till about 1974, if you like, a kind of time tunnel or, or whatever. And a boy in California begins to remember this, which is obviously some kind of, uh, of coincidence, some kind of figure that moves through space, some remembrance, some past life, some connection. So time is an important factor. It's very malleable for Philip K. Dick. And in this context, these figures are regarded as the immortals. They were the immortals then associated with the Sibylline books that they, the Romans used to foretell the future. And the immortals come when humans need them to save the world. And he, they're coming back at that time to save the world in, in the Nixon era. So in that sense, he's mixing the ideas of, uh, of, of creatures who are people who are dead from the afterlife, from the past, uh, from the future, from uh, other planets, uh, in, in combined ideas of focusing on the intelligence and the ability of intelligence to move through time and space and material and appear in different forms. And therefore, the link, the division between, for example, the alien uh, and the angel may not, there's no real division. They both may be the same thing. It depends on what the function is. And this reiterates for me a quality that, Philip K. Dick had, and that was discernment. For example, he was cautious about uh, getting engaged personally for him and, and, and or more with the spiritualism. When uh, now he wasn't against that, he wasn't criticizing or anything, but he, but he, he knew that there were limits to, to its utility to him. And also, he he was cautious about the I Ching, although he uses it in the Man in the High Castle. Because he asked it a question once, who are you? Who is giving this advice? Or who is behind the, the I Ching? And are you the devil? And, and he said, yes. And he, got, he, began to, he began to get concerned about whether it was. But it was a good question to ask. So that discernment issue is still there. If you're dealing with an intelligence that clearly can help, say, the human race and is clearly compassionate, well... Whether it comes from a divine source or from another planet or from uh, uh, Fomalhaut or, or Albemuth uh, is ficti uh, fictional representation of that, or whether it comes through the Dogon people from Sirius, as he, uh, as he suggests in, in, in Valis, it doesn't really matter in many senses if you take a pragmatic approach to it. And with all these intelligence... They're all alien in their experience to, to some extent. Whether we go from uh, Ariman or Bel Belial, which he has in certain of his novels in, in The Dark Force, to uh, angels, uh, up to, to, to God, they're, they're all must feel separate and other to a certain extent. The question is, how do you distinguish between them? And you distinguish between them, between what their intention is and what they're trying to do and what your sense is of what is proper. And therefore, that was why, for me, he needed he needed something, a lens on which to interpret that. And that's why he stayed close to perennial philosophy, stayed close to ideas of Jesus, Christ consciousness, again, like William Blake, uh, and and uh, ideas that we'd recognize in, in, in from Buddhism or Taoism uh, in, a, in a kind of perennial philosophy way. And to complicate matters even further, he often felt that we, there are parallel timelines and, and that he would sometimes himself jump back and forth between them, uh, especially the idea that in, in a parallel universe very close to our own, uh, for example, the Nazis won the Second World War. That's right. And in, in his counterfactual approach, uh, that, 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 that's, that's right. So the, here we have the idea uh, again, we've talked about uh, the idea that it's very difficult to interpret reality. So reality itself can become alien. 
It can be either constructed in an alien way or it can be that we're misinterpreting uh, what, what's happening. So in, in, in many senses, everything is alien. But yes, he did have a preoccupation with time and also a complicated idea uh, that time is moving backwards. <laughs> it's difficult to, to, to work out. And he also referred to this idea of orthogonal time, again, that people like Bernard Carr and the, uh, talk about and probably understand better than a lot of other people. Uh, but they're a difficult uh, concept. But for me, it, it kind of taps into the idea of people like uh, Yeats and in his essay about magic, the idea of the great memory, the ether, the idea that there is a, a, a context which is beyond time and space or which records history or which is uh, is in some sense a, a a different dimension that's there and also when you were talking to uh, john c lilly and in, in, in that you published uh, or you're publishing uh, around this time uh, he, he he talks about that and he talks about also the difficulty and impossibility of mapping out those spaces although he sought to do so because of the sheer proliferation, the infinity uh, of different spaces and the possibilities. Uh, so he, he, he is very open to that idea. Um, but it's also interesting that John C. Lilly as well indicated that one retains one's own individuality. And Philip K. Dick talked about that as well. So one point to, to remember is that despite all those proliferations, there is some coherence, some entity, some spirit which transcends and persists in the different context. So it doesn't... Now, a lot of people believe that the drop of water goes back, as Houston Smith says, into the big, the big uh, uh, river. I, I, I don't believe that to be, on, on the long, long, long time, universal time, to be the immediate object. I, I, I think that a lot of the spiritual traditions suggest about this persistence but they may have to persist in, in uh, different times and space. And another interesting point, a connection here, is with the people like Terence McKenna that were around at the time uh, in California and Robert uh, Anton Wilson, who both had ideas or perceptions of extraterrestrials. Sometimes uh, Wilson believed it was connected to the stars in one of his interpretations. And uh, Terence McKenna experienced also a UFO uh, in his uh, experiments down in Colombia when he with his psilocybin when he went down there when he was a young man with his brother. So he also talks about the, the machine elves, of course. So an interesting question uh, that that uh, would have to come into that equation is what relationship is one establishing with these beings if they're ontologically real? in the context of your taking psilocybin, when you have no idea what their mentality is, what their expectations. When you move on to the next plane, uh, are you sure that you haven't entered into a contract with them? Uh, that uh, you say, well, I didn't understand that, but it's not relevant because you're going into a different domain, if you believe that they're true. Now, again, Philip K. Dick, I think, would have been cautious about some of these things. Philip K. Dick adapted or adopted a classic mystical uh, approach, which uh, was the emptying of the vessel, if you like, uh, the same as uh, behind po possibly the idea of the Kabbalah, the idea of receptivity. So when he broke down, when he had all his traumas, when he had dis dissociation, uh, his ego w w was disintegrating, he becomes kind of empty. And it's at that point that one becomes open to the receptivity of the intervention, like like uh, it happened in 1974. He also, as we talked about before, the beam of light in 1974 also, uh, also echoes the stories he was interested in, the Celtic mythology, the Germanic mythology of the wounded man, the wounded soldier that needs healing uh, from a feminine force. And that's uh, that's there in Tristan and Isolde, and uh, and he he called his daughter uh, Isolde, who, who she, I think she's become a filmmaker, uh, but she was she was uh, given that name at the and that goes back to well uh, Irish myth, the myth uh, uh, that 
people like Joseph Campbell was interested in. So when he's uh, that healing figure was also consistent with the idea of the the, the Shekinah in in the in the Jewish tradition, like kind of feminine divine divine force, or the Gnostic tradition Sophia. So again, those forces he doesn't rule them out. What I find a bit difficult to understand, Jeff, in in some of these debates, is that a lot of the people that are open to mechanical elves, uh, to to UFOs to uh, explanations that they exist. They're not open to any other religious explanations. They're not open to say, well, this is the Virgin Mary, for example. Well, that can't be. It must be a, 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 some other kind of uh, experience. I find that a bit difficult uh, to, to understand. It doesn't intellectually sound consistent to me. Yes, yes, I can accept these figures are real, but I don't accept that I might be an angel, for example, from God. I, I, I find that a closed-minded way. And, and Philip K. Dick wasn't closed-minded. He, he was a classic pragmatist in the way that William James describes it. You have to keep all your options on the table. You have to look at everything without predetermining what the final uh, result is. And I think Philip K. Dick uh, was ahead of the game in, in some senses from that. Well, you've alluded to the enormous use of psychedelic drugs that was going on in the San Francisco Bay Area in the 1960s, 1970s. I know I was there at, at, at the time. And uh, so was Timothy Leary, Robert Anton Wilson, Terrence McKenna. What, what is not clear to me, uh, maybe you can fill me in a bit, is the extent to which uh, Philip K. Dick was involved in the use of psychedelics. He was certainly uh, very interested in the culture associated with uh, with psychedelics, and they all knew of him. He he, he was he was getting recognition uh, he, uh, at that stage, not not widespread recognition, but from people that that knew. According to uh, certain people, I think Ray Nelson, who went to uh, his writer friend, who went to high school with him, so he, he knew him very well. Uh, and he said, and I think I think he has to be a credible, the most credible witness uh, in in this context. He said he only took LSD twice uh, with him, and he said the second time that he had a bad experience with the uh, LSD. So uh, he took, we know he took amphetamines very much uh, to help him write, uh, and that he did suffer from agoraphobia, and he had he, he was always subject to kind of t- types of anxiety. But he doesn't seem to have uh, embraced the psychedelic approach, although a lot of people believe that his world must be consistent with that. But uh, in fact, and there's something in a mystical purist sense about his his willingness not to go to go further uh, in that. So it it didn't play, although it was very important in in the cultural context. Um, and one might uh, extrapolate that, that they were a significant experience. I, I, I think the particular, the first one may have been uh, related to his his link back to Latin, the early Roman period, uh, or may specifically, or he may have had uh, other ideas before that. But he had had when I think it was in high school in an exam, he had began to to begun to hear voices. So he didn't need to have prosthetic help uh, uh, to, 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 to get access to, to these things. And I think he was very, very cautious uh, uh, about that because uh, there's, there's two things about in, in the mystical sense. Uh, one, we don't have a lot of control over our mind and, and our unconscious anyway. So it could be a confusing factor. Now, I, I'm not taken away from the the fact that a lot of people get breakthroughs and it helps them and they can be used. I'm not talking about that, but if you you are open mystically and you're exploring that, you may not need them and it may create a doubt in your mind about where these things came from. Were they created? Were they sensations of something? Uh, Were they illusions? You may not be in a better position to interpret what they are in some sense uh, if you don't need them. So... Uh, and, and, and the second thing associated with that is, if you look at Evelyn Underhill, and or even Malachi Martin, who was aware of these dimensions too, uh, from a, diff- a totally different context, but he was uh, he was very aware of that other world. Uh, all the mystics say that 
there's a zone that you have to just move through. You, you, you don't dwell in the, in the lower zones or the middle zones or the mid-world because they're dangerous and they're not where we belong. So you go through them. And Evelyn Underhill, is, she had explored magic as well. So she, she had some knowledge about what she was talking about. And if you read uh, one of the novels she wrote, it seems she was quite aware of conjuring and she may have engaged in, in, in those activities. Now, there's a big difference between standing in a circle and uh, compelling or seeking to compel the other world to do your bidding and being receptive to benign forces. There's a quite, there's a quite uh, different emphasis. And Philip K. Dick, again, I think was cautious. He had discernment and uh, he, he, uh, the short answer is it doesn't seem that LSD had a major impact, although we don't know you might argue that LSD was significant, but I, I don't think so. It doesn't seem seem to be the case. Well, even two experiences can be extremely profound. And I guess the, the point I wanted to bring up is that under LSD, people typically do have that sense of uh, animism, that the universe itself is conscious, that it's speaking to us. It, it might be, as you suggest, mechanical elves or, or uh, in seemingly intelligent entities that could take almost any form whatsoever from... Uh, a, an elf or a robotic form to simply talking colors. Yes, you, you could be right because his ideas of zebra and valus were consistent with the descriptions of people that have taken LSD and, and as you would know about things coming alive, the animism, the animation of the material world, the blurring of boundaries. So all that is there. It's very possible that that did um, Although, uh, because he had prior uh, experiences and uh, his his disposition was towards that mystical approach, in, in my view, um, I think he had some sense, and it was also very important for him to have a rational framework. Although, when you read the exegesis, it doesn't look rational in some senses. Uh, it is in it is in a very intelligent way. Uh, well, it is rational in a specific sense, but a lot of people think uh, it's crazy and inconsistent. Uh, but that, that's, that's showing his, his openness. And he, he did want to translate. So it certainly could be argued that it may have more uh, impact. But there is, a, uh, there is an idea, I think, and it's been becoming very strong, that one must have some kind of, and I'm not saying you say that, and you, you never would, but that some people say that these are necessary to get a qualitatively different experience. And I'm not saying that's, that's not true, but a qualitatively different experience, <coughs> certainly the, <coughs> we can judge it by the effects. But the mystics would say you can also achieve those results. That they may be longer. It may not work for everybody, but through, through, through discipline and receptivity. And certainly it was clear to Huxley that he couldn't, uh, personally achieve achieve those mystical states without help. So it may be, in my view, that those substances are better used for people that need them, for people that may benefit from being able to escape from a thing they can't do, for, for addiction, as the, as the studies say, the DMT or whatever. Uh, or if their mind is of a particular way, very left-brained or whatever, it may be it may work better with those people. I don't think that Philip K. Dick needed more right brain activity. He, he needed probably to to contain it because whether the, it was the construction of his brain, he he also had uh, he would have been receiving medication, uh, I think, for his, his his anxiety and other things early on. Some of those things can have profound effects as well that <laughs> can be equally as powerful. When it comes to the afterlife and the literature of the afterlife, what I've encountered is, is a sense of gradually the human consciousness becomes less and less 
attached to the physical body. First, you lose the actual physical body completely, but you have an, a, another body like a doppelganger that is equivalent to the physical body, but it exists as a thought form, maybe an astral body. Eventually, you let go of that. You develop a body that's even more subtle and more subtle until you lose the need for any sort of a body as, as one evolves through the afterlife. And so, so it suggests that when we even begin to think about what does it mean to be a conscious entity, that there's a lot of room to play with well beyond the, the normal constraints that we in the physical plane seem to imagine that conscious entities need to be physical as we are. Yeah. It's, it's very, very interesting. If, if you read Swedenborg, as, as you know, Heaven and Hell, and he has very specific uh, descriptions of the afterlife. And again, it's consistent with many other worlds and people living in ways that are very recognizable uh, to us. And that was also consistent, you know, living in houses and having partners. You know, it's a lot nicer, but there are other worlds, and that's consistent with a kind of Gnostic idea as well. It's also consistent with other worlds in the Celtic tradition. That was very clear. There were other worlds. You could go to them. They were a lot more pleasant. This is a tough one. But in relation to spiritual evolution, it's interesting when you compare the Christianity and Buddhism in relation to what the kind of optimum position is or where you're going to. Now, I think there's a bit of a slight disjuncture in, in articulation. It may be because of language, or, or but there's an interesting, there's an interesting idea. It seems in a lot of Buddhism, in Buddhism, that emptiness is is a kind of supreme value, and in Christian traditions, uh, and in Jewish traditions, the light is is the supreme value. So you have light and emptiness and in some ways they don't seem uh, reconcilable but uh, if we begin to think for example that lightness the quality of masslessness uh, is a is a thing that uh, that unites them even if they're etymo supposedly etymologically unrelated uh, we can begin to, to to look at them and also light is massless so so there is there is possibilities or need to begin to think of well, what is the higher dimension. Now, if you look, what, what is alien in human nature in relation to Philip K. Dick? Well, he believes that cruelty and violence are alien to our fundamental nature. So if you take it the other way around, well, what is not the other? What is not the other is kindness, empathy and compassion. So he's making the case that kindness, empathy and compassion are who we are. So in many senses, when they say, or people or mystics say that God is love, the universe is love, you are love or whatever, in many senses that discarding is a letting go of attachments that are heavy in some sense, that preclude you from rising to the domain in which your nature exists. And in the Gospel of Thomas, which was also influential for uh, Philip K. Dick, uh, Jesus says um, that if people ask you where you come from, say, we came from the, the, the zone uh, where light came into being. So this idea that we came from light and we're going back to it, and that going back to it is discarding those elements that are extraneous to that central value of, of kindness, compassion, which is light and powerful and which is associated with the heart. And that the mystics are suggesting that all the other things are irrelevant to that. And that hatred, violence, uh, obsessions with material things, what they do is they weigh you down in the material world and in the afterlife, that the the, the zone that you can get to a certain zone, but because still mentally you're attached to certain things, you cannot move. So by failing to focus on the highest value, it's impossible to move from a certain zone. And, and that's, he has some notion uh, of purgatory or a kind of limbo, of, which, which is the same, which echoes the Bardo plane. And why people get 
caught in those things, is they become focused on irrelevant things, on things that are not their business to do, uh, and not their, but it depends on a presumption or an identification of who you are. That's why if we're light and light, uh, or, or be, a light beam, of course, it's, it's light, but it's also information. And Vallis or some of these interventions, he saw Gnostic terms. They were interventions from the divine force to try and bring you back on the path. They were benign. They were downloads. And you made yourself receptive to, to them. And then the information, the lightness helped you. And that evolution was not just for, for this plane. It's in relation to where you want to go. And the question, well, maybe people want to live with the this, this strange creatures they see in that world. Maybe, maybe that's the, what people want. And if they do, good luck to them. I don't particularly want to do that, and they, they don't interest me at all. I'm very happy to go back towards the light. I don't have any uh, problem with that. Sounds good to me. I like the descriptions of it. I like the mystical uh, experience or, or feeling of that idea of spiritual light. And it may be, he, he's good at explaining things, so we may get it inside out. Maybe um, in some sense, we, we see those things as as remote from us, as as, as objects. He makes it clear, and uh, he was interested in, in, in quantum theory as well. W what he's saying is that the percipient is, uh, or has to be there, the observer has to be there, but you as the observer have to observe that you're the observer or know that you're participating in this. That if you remain asleep, if you don't take the veil away, if you don't, it might for some people be taken the, 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 the psychedelic, if you don't ex get out of that prison, then you will be in someone else's prison, which is an invisible prison, uh, a black iron prison that, that has some reality that represents the desire of certain forces in the psyche to imprison other people uh, that, that has actual reality, but has a deeper spiritual reality. There may be some force in the universe, the Aramanic force that Steiner talked about, that wants to imprison us, that, that Steiner uh, identified with, with science. Um, uh, I don't, although he engaged in a lot of exploration of science, I think we have to think of Philip K. Dick as pre-science or prescient and there's an interesting connection between the words so he's prescient he's seeing what's happened he's imbibing all the, from the wells of all great knowledge and he believes as Surawardi would have done that the highest form of knowledge is revelation revelation depends on receptivity it's not constructed in the left brain. It's not constructed by ratiocination. It's not constructed out of a pure materialist analysis or a naturalist uh, analysis of the world. It's dependent on a higher force. All the mystics say at a certain time that it's not just an ascent, but there is a descent. There is a sense of intervention, a sense of connection, uh, and a sense of connection to the true form of the universe and the true form of, of what humans are. And Philip K. Dick doesn't depart from the perennial philosophy in that sense at all. He's very, very consistent. But he wants, I think he anticipates that the religions have failed. A bit like Bishop Pike, he realizes that the institutional religions have failed. And one of the reasons they failed, Jeff, which is interesting, if you look at, say, Malachi Martin again, they failed because they have adopted an ultra-materialist viewpoint. A lot of them don't believe in, in, in the divine forces. They believe in uh, heaven, creating heaven on earth. And, and, and it's become that dominance has displaced ideas of the supernatural as being real. So that has uh, afflicted the churches themselves. And Philip K. Dick realized that. So he realized that gnosis in the sense of individual experience of the divine and of re that reality, the real, that Evelyn Underhill talks about, was the antidote and the necessary balance to agnosis or agnosti uh, agnosticism. Now, that's a word that people, I think, may get wrong in some senses because it's, it's been used in terms of, I oh, just, I don't really believe, but give me the evidence and I will. But it goes back to Thomas Huxley. And Thomas Huxley said that uh, agnosticism was a position that required 
that to believe anything, it had to be scientifically provable. So this was part of that totalizing force of science where scientism became an ideology. So as against that, the revelatory approach of the mystic, or every individual has access to, says, I can have gnosis by being aware of the higher dimensions, by being open, by taking my left brain out, by taking cultural constructs out, I can uh, communicate with the universe. And he, he said it as well, that if the Logos is, is true, if there is that divine ordering force in the universe, Christ consciousness, whatever you want to call it, in the universe, but the Logos, then you must be able to hear its voice. And what may be speaking to you is that Logos itself. And it kind of makes sense. And he believed that in the past that humankind had access to that voice and they lost it. And in many senses, that's that's what the fall was about. It was that cut with the connection with the divine force because of the way uh, they, they developed in that context. Very articulately put, uh, it's a beautiful description, and I can't help but feel that uh, after listening to you, that you you see Philip K. Dick as a kindred spirit. Oh yes, uh, Philip Kindred Dick. Yeah. <laughs> yes, I, I do indeed. Uh, I, I think he his agoraphobia uh, and agora the public place and not in public place he didn't he, he 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 retreated but he retreated as a a mystic would do as a a monk would do so he he was very monastic in that sense it doesn't necessarily have to be very bad if you can create something out of it so he he was very afraid of where the world was going and uh, it was said and i i come to that conclusion myself but there is some corroboration from some people or, uh, around him that in some senses he was intuiting what was happening around him whether it be in the military industrial complex or whatever he was getting a sense of where these forces were going and he anticipated the future and he saw the future now he was a bit optimistic that once ne nixon fell that everything was going to be okay but i mean nixon's friends were there Rumsfeld comes in at that time and he's exerted a big influence. I mean, the apparatus is there. He also said in one of his books quite early on, he said that uh, you have to be careful that both the Soviets and the, the fuzz, as he called them, the police in America, they're both interested in shadow government. And he used that term very early on. He said one has to be careful that uh, not to have a dualistic idea of what's happening in the world around you. He believed that the military industrial complex was more unified than, 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 than people th uh, think. But yes, I agree with him in relation to his, his accurate anticipation of the, 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 the danger of a kind of tech totalitarianism. I agree with him on that. I agree with him in, in, in the uh, absolute uh, protection or, or, or assertion of the nature, our spiritual nature, as fundamental. I agree with him uh, on the necessity for the spirit to evolve, and I agree with him on, on the, the nature of, and complexity of, of, of the universe, which requires exploration in a very open-minded way uh, and motivated by values of uh, kindness, compassion, and empathy, and that whatever religious philosophical ideological doctrine a, a person has if those values are not there then it becomes worthless if, if your religion leads you to a situation where those ultimate factors of compassion uh, can't be manifest well then it's inconsistent with the the, the fundamental roots of uh, of those religions and in the context, for me, what that leads to is in the context of a failure of the religions, of the failure, failure of the religious structures, um, that it's not the religious structures, say, of Christianity that are important. It's the fundamental affirmations of the spirit and the values that are important, the same as in Judaism or Buddhism or Taoism. So the, the response to 
the agnostic totalitarian uh, state of the world that's forming uh, the new global super state. Uh, the balancing mechanism is for people to rise above uh, kind of cultural constructs that stop them exploring their own individual sense. It doesn't mean that they reject them, but they can build on them in a zone of cooperation uh, with uh, and, and fellowship uh, and co uh, across the, 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 in a cosmopolitan way, irrespective of what other identities exist, and focusing on the total unifying nature, spiritual identity of humans. That is the primary identity. And it's also the identity which is being attacked and will be attacked by the transhumanist movement, by the post-humanist movement, they don't believe that spirit exists in the same way. And that's where we, not only should we come together, but we have to come together because this is, this is really the end of times in that context, the end, the possible end. If, if technology is going to colonize human consciousness, uh, well then, that's the time that we should defend and assert the full nature of human uh, consciousness and do so with a quantum leap in human evolution where we begin to actually practice some of these values, where we begin to take those things and apply them in the real world beyond the material is, is, uh, paradigm and get out of the silos that we're being forced into by artificial d division to be careful not to be put in any categories. So in that sense, yes, he is. And I, I do find him to have been very uh, courageous, uh, very uh, brave. Uh, I'm sure he, 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 you get a sensation when we're, when we're having a conversation about certain figures. Yeah, I have always got a distinctive feeling about them. There's a diff for example, William Blake feels very energetic to me. Um, actually, uh, Joan of Arc felt more anxious in some senses, although she was very courageous. There's different different senses that that come true, um, and or uh, a uh, um, a. E. Russell feels more avuncular and, and, and how he was described. And I, I think that Philip K. Dick sounds or feels more lighthearted and, 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 and as, as his friends described him. Now, granted, he had huge problems and people can point to things he did which were very bad or antisocial or uh, hurt people. Um, but that, that's the same case in everybody's life. We've all done things that are, are wrong or stupid or mistaken. Uh, and the idea of evolution is that we're going to make mistakes that's what human that's the great gift of human nature computers may not make mistakes in the same way but we have that capacity and from that uh, from that tendency to make mistakes uh, that's where we, we will grow and learn and we have superior possibilities because of that so yes as an affirmation of the human spirit and the necessity to engage in it to activate our own spirit so we do not become automatic beings so we we do not become automatons so we become autonomous beings that recognize we have the greatest gift of consciousness within ourselves and that what that was there for or what we should utilize it for is to uh, engender relationships uh, with the positive forces in, in the universe to to expand that to create a a, a tipping point uh, in that against forces which seem negative or are negative which want to contract which want to crystallize which want to fix things which want to render everything into materialist tied down form instead of that spontaneous organic fluid uh, nature which is human consciousness well james tunney once again an incredibly articulate profound message from you uh, that weaves so many different cult cultural threads together. What a pleasure it has been to be with you, and I'm happy to let our viewers know that we will continue these conversations uh, long into the future. So uh, once again, James, thank you so much for being with me today. And, and thank you, uh, Jeff. I'm humbled every time I'm talking to you when I look at your great experience when I look at your uh, conversations, the fantastic work that you've done in this exploration. I do feel very privileged to have the opportunity to talk to you. So thank you very much again, as, as always. And I think it's a privilege for me 
to talk to you and certainly a privilege for me to be able to share these conversations with our viewers. So for those of you listening or watching, thank you for being with us. Thank you.